Good morning, everyone, and welcome to my latest home away from home. If you're wondering why the hell I'm still broadcasting from a hotel room as opposed to my little studio or what passes for a studio in my house, well, it's because I don't have a home, neither do I have a car. Uh, let me explain. Um, water pipe burst two weeks ago at my house. Uh, landlords refused to fix it without me being present there. So I was planning on being present there uh, this morning, but I was a quarter of, the of a mile rather away from the parking lot uh, at the Charlotte airport and my car broke down. Um, by the way, I, I'm, this is not an appeal for help or anything like that. I'm under extended warranty. However, I've discovered that it's going to take many hours for a tow truck to show up under my warranty coverage. And on top of that, it's going to be three weeks before the local dealership is even able to deal with this transmission problem that it's having right now. So <laughs> I have no idea what's going to be happening. And frankly, I, I'm not very pleased about coming back from the UK, even though I certainly couldn't have stayed there any longer. But enough of me griping about my problems. Let's talk about NASA's problems. So here's the deal. You may be wondering, what am I talking about? How did he identify a problem with Artemis before NASA did? Blah, blah, blah. What's this guy saying? You know, yeah, he's always full of crap, etc. Well, actually, I'm going to show you a clip from a video that I released released a few weeks ago that identified a particular problem that RMS is experiencing right now and an ongoing problem that they've had for a while. Check it out. Also, as you can see here, this is a depiction from the European Space Agency of what they would like a lunar colony to look like. They have a number of designs for lunar bases, a lot of them really, really good ones, including things that are designed by respected architectural firms built into these plans or radiation shielding, in situ resource utilization, and also plans on how to deploy these bases utilizing commercial rockets. And herein lies our next problem. We haven't really planned out how we're going to integrate other national partners into this overall plan. Europe and Japan have already committed to helping out with establishing a lunar base, resupplying it, etc. And yet we don't seem to have their missions built into the framework of the plan anywhere. Why not? Why have none of these details been worked out yet, given the fact that we are now well on our way to getting the Artemis plan moving? So, not enough of a plan, not enough of an effort being made by NASA to engage all of the international partners who are very enthusiastic about supporting this program. Interestingly enough, just yesterday, or maybe it was the day before yesterday, kind of losing track of time, the NASA Office of Inspector General released a report that said precisely the same thing. Please, 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 please subscribe. So here's what my good friends at the NASA Office of Inspector General found. Quote, interest in the Artemis campaign is high across the international space community as evidenced by NASA's 54 Artemis-related international instruments and the 22 signatories, 23 rather, signatories to the Artemis Accords. However, the agency lacks an overarching strategy to coordinate Artemis contributions from international space agencies and entities. 
Except for the Gateway Program, the Artemis Campaign does not have comprehensive forums, boards, panels, and working groups for its international partners to routinely discuss topics such as flight and mission planning, safety, and research integration. In contrast, the ISS program, seen as a model of long-term international space cooperation, employs these forums as well as on-site representation from partner agencies. While the architecture or blueprint for the first three Artemis missions is well established, NASA lacks an overall architecture beyond Artemis IV for lunar exploration of the moon that includes estimated cost to be born and responsibilities assumed by its international national partners. The report goes on to detail exactly what the international partners have done thus far and what they're planning to do for Artemis 1, 2, and 3, and frankly, it isn't a whole lot. The European Service Module, of course, is involved in all three missions. In addition to that, on Artemis 1, there are some CubeSats dispatched by the Japanese Space Agency, the European Space Agency, and also the Italian Space Agency. The Deep Space Network also controls Contributed, and then you had the Matroshka Astrorad Radiation Experiment. Now, on the first CLPS scouting missions that are being sent out by NASA, there's a little bit more international cooperation. For example, on the Astrobotic Peregrine Lander, there's some small autonomous robots from Mexico, personal mementos from Germany, okay, not a lot of science there, but at least something, a rover from the UK, although frankly, I'm not certain if that rover is still included under the current payload. I'm not sure if they got their little spider rovers going in time. Also a commemorative plaque from Hungary and Japan and a radiation detector from Germany. A little bit more, but frankly, not much. And then the Blue Ghost mission from Firefly Airspace has a lunar navigation system experiment from Italy. And finally, on the Intuitive Machines mission being sent by SpaceX, they have a laser retro reflector from the European Space Agency and a lunar space environment monitor from the Republic of Korea. After that, though, there's nothing, or virtually nothing. The European Space Module and the Deep Space Network for Artemis 2 and 3, and that's the extent of it. However, just to be clear, this doesn't mean that international partners don't have an interest in contributing their fair share to Artemis. Quite the contrary. The report goes on to say, quote, In addition to contributions, ESA and JAXA have already committed to providing the Artemis missions such as service and habitat modules, CubeSats, and a transfer vehicle. Both agencies are exploring development of launch capabilities with their Ariane 6 and H3 rockets, respectively, that could provide cargo to the gateway or the lunar surface, potentially saving NASA hundreds of millions of dollars in launch costs. ESA and JAXA officials we met with noted that their agencies are eager to contribute to Artemis in the hopes that their astronauts, many of whom have spaceflight experience on the ISS, will be included in crewed missions to the moon. NASA has also implemented agreements with several other space agencies agencies, including those from India, Israel, and the United Arab Emirates. The report then provides details on the confirmed and potential Artemis contributions of NASA and selected space agencies, and that reveals just how little these international partners have actually been exploited. While virtually all international partners have confirmed their willingness to contribute robotic exploration, as far as launch services to lunar orbit, only NASA has these services confirmed, whereas ESA and JAXA have expressed their interest in providing those things, but nothing confirmed. And as far as astronauts are concerned, the Canadian Space Agency and ESA are both confirmed, and that's it, aside from NASA. As far as crew transportation is concerned, only ESA and NASA. And then cargo transportation. Again, you've got JAXA being confirmed, 
and that's it. ESA has expressed interest, but nothing confirmed because of no agreements. Now, the gateway is a different story. The Canadians, the Europeans, the Japanese have all confirmed their contributions to the lunar gateway. That makes a big difference. But surface transportation, once again, nobody except NASA, even though Japan has expressed an interest. And then lunar communications, only NASA and the European Space Agency, in spite of the fact that the Australians and the Canadians and the Japanese have all expressed interest. So why is this happening? Well, the report does a good job in identifying the problems. Quote, Artemis missions need better coordination and integration of international partner participation. The lack of a coordinated approach makes it difficult for NASA to manage expectations regarding an international partner's potential contribution and creates confusion about what they should contribute. This theme became apparent in responses to our questionnaires and in our on-site meetings meetings with ESA and JAXA officials. In contrast, the ISS program complies with NASA's program management requirements and has established program boards, panels, and working groups that include its international partners. These forums provide routine opportunities for the ISS program and its partners to discuss topics such as flight and mission planning, safety, and research integration. And once you get to Artemis IV, things get even worse. Quote, beyond Artemis IV, NASA lacks an overall architecture for exploration of the moon that includes estimated costs borne and responsibilities assumed by its international partners. As a result, NASA and its partners are not clear on what type of lunar surface infrastructure they can afford, and partners are unsure of their specific roles and responsibilities. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, that's exactly what I said in November. I'm at least happy that NASA has identified these things. Without a clearly defined Artemis architecture that includes realistic cost estimates, it has been difficult for NASA to fully assess and capitalize on international partner resources and capabilities. This increases the funding risk for NASA's partners. Without a clear sense of NASA's needs and the associated requirements, partners do not have sufficient information to work with their governments to identify potential contributions to the effort. Representatives from several international partners that we interviewed expressed frustration about the lack of a detailed lunar surface architecture from NASA, noting that it is difficult for them to develop their own budgets and determine what they can ultimately contribute to Artemis. While budgets for NASA's programs fluctuate year to year, several international partners try to identify their potential contributions years in advance and often require detailed trade studies that examine cost, schedule, performance, and system requirements. Additionally, funding is often more difficult to obtain without binding agreements detailing the specific contribution arrangements. And by the way, this isn't the first time that the Office of Inspector General has identified these problems. Way back in 2016, the OIG criticized how long it was taking for agreements with international partners to be solidified. And yet, the problem got even worse. Quote, on average, since 2012, the overall processing time once an agreement is initially submitted to the State Department to when NASA receives final approval for signature has increased a total of 74 days from 142 days in 2012 to approximately 216 days in 2021. We found that the greatest increase in time is during the negotiation stage with NASA international partners and also during the State Department's final review, which saw an increase from an average of six days in 2012 to 17 days in 2021. There are also export control restrictions, which really mess up our ability to properly communicate with our partners astronauts. Quote, export control restrictions also complicate NASA's communication with international partners, impede the use of the partner's knowledge and experience, and present possible barriers to expanding such partnerships. For example, according to NASA officials, Foreign, foreign partners have been asked to leave meetings related to Artemis, the James Webb Space Telescope, and the launch of the Boeing Company's commercial crew Starliner spacecraft to the ISS because export authorizations were not in place and the partners were not 
cleared, quote, unquote. Looking forward, partner agencies have told us delays in the export control process could present issues during emergency situations in spaceflight operations when access and information would need to be immediately shared. But guess who's getting a lot more information than these international partners? Well, the Russians, of course, because they're part of the ISS and always have been. If the Russians can be cleared on these things, why the hell can't the Europeans and the Japanese? And here's another example of the nonsense that NASA is having to deal with while trying to cooperate with these international partners. Quote, like it did with Orion, NASA requested a unique export classification for the Gateway in 2021 that is still pending implementation. Without a classification change for the elements, the program must conduct a time-intensive review and determine the jurisdiction and classifications of each export and obtain the necessary licenses from the State of Commerce departments when necessary. NASA's International Law Practice Group, which advises the agency on issues of international concern, including export control, supports a change for Gateway that would move classification for the system under the Commerce Control List, making it substantially easier to change the information with international partners working on the Gateway. However, the rulemaking process of evaluating technology Technologies that are part of the Gateway's power and propulsion element for potential removal from the U.S. munitions list, yes, the power and propulsion element is currently regarded as a weapon, has not been completed. Absolutely ridiculous. By 2025, NASA will have run up a $93 billion price tag for the Artemis program. The European service module alone saved NASA over $2 billion of taxpayer money, and so much more could have been saved if we had a better international cooperative arrangement in place. But of course, we do not, and the Office of Inspector General had 10 points, 10 corrective actions that NASA needs to take. Number one, establish a coordination strategy with NASA's international partners that includes recurring forums specifically for Artemis. Two, establish NASA-led Artemis campaign boards and working groups for partners with agreed-upon commitments and provide opportunities for liaison representation from international partner agencies. Three, issue a detailed strategy and architecture for missions beyond Artemis IV that considers potential international partner roles. Four, perform a detailed gap analysis and cost estimate for Artemis missions beyond Artemis IV that will help inform a cost-sharing strategy with international partners. By the way, NASA has not agreed to do that one. I wonder why. Number five, establish a full-time export control team dedicated to Artemis programs in support of spaceflight developments. Number six, review export control requirements and consider additional roles for partners astronauts to increase their utilization in NASA spaceflight operations. That one is just absolutely ridiculous that we should even have to require that. These partner astronauts are risking their lives to explore the moon. Why don't they have an equal role already? Number seven, establish a full-time export control team dedicated to the Artemis programs in support of spaceflight operations. Number eight, coordinate with other federal agencies to develop a unique export export classification for the Gateway Program. Number nine, execute Artemis agreements with key international space agency partners to ensure partner roles and responsibilities. And number 10, develop an automated routing method for processing international agreements within NASA to increase timeliness. Who knows how long it's going to take to get all of this done, but it absolutely has to get done if Artemis is going to remain cost-effective and if it isn't going to be doomed to cancellation someday because of all of the idiotic waste. Smash that like, hit that subscribe. We are less than 6,000 subscribers away from that magical 100K. Please tell your friends and family members about my channel. Please like this video and check out the 
the description for various ways to support my future content. And keep in mind that I am making one free video for my Patreon and Discord supporters every 60 days. So free content for my supporters on Patreon and Discord every 60 days if you decide to become part of my growing family there. And as always, guys, stay angry about space.